name is Steve Schneider. I am the convener, the editor, the, the thing behind Design Right Studio. And um, that's who's producing this adventure in a podcasting. And um, joined today by three folks, and I'll let them introduce themselves as I'll call them out. So Doug, go ahead, say hello. Hi, everyone. So I'm, I'm Doug Cohen, and I am an adjunct at SUNY Poly. And uh, about 10 years ago, Steve introduced me to the world of hypertext in TiddlyWiki, and I've been obsessed pretty much ever since. And so that's what happens if you really like this stuff, you become a podcast host. I'm Magenta. Hello. Hello. I'm Magenta Ann Ward. Um, I'm an adjunct at SUNY Poly also, and I own my own commercial print shop and commercial design firm. And come on, same story. Magenta walked into my class. Yes. And now he's an adjunct. And about 10 years ago. And Jeremy, the guest of honor. Hello. Steve, hi. Hi. Um, Doug Magenta, hi. Um, yes, I'm Jeremy Rustin. I'm in Oxford, even though it looks like I'm in classical um, Greece from my background. Um, and as Steve uh, says, I'm the uh, original creator of TiddlyWiki, but long since given up the mantle um, to a kind of diffuse community that, uh, that now owns TiddlyWiki and keeps it alive, including um, uh, the rest of you on this call. So we're, we're all responsible for it now. <laughs> so where I want to start is with um, a TiddlyWiki story. And Jeremy, you have the most, your, your, your origin story with TiddlyWiki is the origin story of all of us with TiddlyWiki. So I was wondering if you might take us back situate us in time a little bit and how did this idea come to you and where did you start with and where have you moved and then we'll let Doug ask a question so I'll I'll, I'll, I'll try and give a very I've, I've told this I've told these stories many times before and uh, and something that I guess we should try to do is um, rather that uh, you know it's easy to doggedly go through the history but I must try and reflect back on what's changed that uh, my motivation for working on TiddlyWiki was that I wanted to participate in the blogosphere, but I found the blogging tools of the age um, uh, difficult to work with because um, they- when was, uh, that? when was that? What 2003, year? four sort of time. So it was the kind of the, the height of the blogosphere. And I was um, uh, very engaged with the blogosphere in terms of reading lots of blogs, but didn't write a blog. But I found that um, at that time, this is pre-Twitter, this is um, sort of classical blogging, so to speak. Um, and what I didn't like was the way that when you start a new post, it was basically aping Microsoft Word. It was presenting you with a blank sheet of paper, which sounds completely inoffensive. But what I've always found is that presented with a blank sheet of paper, what I'll generally do is fill up a sheet of paper with writing. That there's a kind of um, by by working around these big chunks um, that they uh, they tend to. Whereas I found or I had been t I'd discovered that my writing was much better if I was forced to write really concisely, and that way I was forced to avoid weasel words, and that the blogging form, just like essays and novels, seemed to require a whole kind of plumbing of introduction and you know arm waving, rhetorical flourishes. And I felt that I yeah, felt I didn't want to write like that. And I wanted to explore writing in a, in a terser way where I would try and capture ideas with little fragments of text and make them interlink. And uh, so there was also this idea that, um, so, I mean, what I described was a personal wiki, which did exist already then. Um, but what was different was the idea that the entries in the wiki should be so small that you could see more than one at a time. And that um, I felt gave you a different sort of uh, relationship uh, with it. So uh, I did a prototype thinking um, that I was just uh, prototyping the user interface. So I implemented it as a static HTML file with no backend and then put it on the internet and uh, was delighted, got a great, fantastic reception. Uh, but a big part of the reception was people saying, this is amazing, if only it worked properly. And what they meant was that you couldn't save changes in it. And of course you couldn't, because it was a, a single static HTML file. Uh, and uh, then 
uh, the breakthrough came when we found a way, a, a quirk of Firefox that did allow TiddlyWiki to save changes. And then that, uh, that really unleashed a, um, you know, something that I wasn't really in control of and nobody was in control of. But I think it was, uh, again, trying to take this uh, perspective of looking backwards. I think what we discovered was that that period was a transition period between the age of documents and the age of the web. So, you know, in the 90s, a whole generation of people in offices were trained to think of computing as being amassing files on their hard drive, doing things to those hard drive, to those files, and then <laughs> typically emailing them or sharepointing them to somebody else. And people had evolved whole ways of working, both in terms of how they worked with other people, but also how they work with themselves. You know, I'll, I'm working on a Word document, I'll take a copy and put it on this USB stick, and then I know even if my laptop explodes that I've still got a copy of it. Those sort of very fundamental affordances you get with documents. And then uh, 2003, four, as I said, we were entering the age of web applications where there was suddenly um, a whole, oh, sorry, pressing the wrong button, um, suddenly a whole uh, a, a array of, um, of new services that were available kind of cheaper and with lower friction because you didn't need to install anything. But it came at this cost that the conceptual model um, uh, was completely different. Uh, and it turns out that TiddlyWiki, by embodying both things, by giving people the user experience of a web application, with the semantics, uh, for want of a better word, of a file, turned out to be a useful thing. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think uh, that's, that's sometimes surprising to people who come from a traditional software development background, because it's an ultra unorthodox way of looking at the web. You know, it's both, a, it's a funny web application, and it's not a normal office application, because as an office application, it has this characteristic that is both the data file and the executable that you use to edit it. So uh, that, I think that was why it, it became so popular was that it enabled a completely new way of computing, of thinking about web applications. Uh, and that's continued to this day, but of course, um, thanks to the interest in TiddlyWiki and the help from the community, I've been able to, we've been able to extend it way beyond its original um, uh, uh, sort of form. So now, as well as the form that I've described as a single HTML file containing a big load of JavaScript, it can also run under Node.js and run under AWS Lambda, et cetera. So it's, a, it's, it's basically a general purpose JavaScript wiki with this one capability that you don't find in other wikis. Well, thank you and welcome, Peter. Peter is one of the students who- Hi, Peter. Maybe, Peter, maybe this is your second day of using TiddlyWiki, right? Uh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so welcome. So Doug, you were going to jump in there, I, I, I sense. Well, uh, honestly, I, I really just wanted to ask, did, did you ever envision TiddlyWiki exploding how it did? And, and some context behind that um, question is really, um, once people get familiar with it, it, it really has become a, a really great alternative to these commercial products that I think everyone knows, um, you know, Evernote you know, everyone knew it from a mobile app development and I knew someone who was using it. And I said, well, why don't you try this instead? And they were floored by the capabilities, you know, thinking of Rome, thinking of all the, the new products. So, so that's, that's question one. And then just a comment as you were doing your description, I, I will say, I, I think the, the idea behind TiddlyWiki and the introduction to it has really evolved me personally and how I write, where you talked about, you know, creating your content in these little chunks, um, you know, obviously reminds me back of the, the, the Mark, Tain, Mark Twain quote of, I haven't had the time to develop a short letter. And, and I think honestly, having now, you know, 10 plus years of experience working in TiddlyWiki, it has changed how I communicate. So uh, one question and one comment behind that. Oh, well, that's great. Um... Uh, I, did I imagine it would be so popular? Um, I didn't imagine TiddlyWiki would be, but 
I, but I did know that what I wanted to do um, for a long time, I think I'd wanted to do something like Tiddlywiki to, to, I mean, now it's easy. I have the words for it to, to, um, to lead an open source project was what I always wanted, but I wouldn't have in 2003, I wouldn't have exactly put it in those words. It might've said something about shareware. <laughs> um, uh, it was a different time then, but, um, but as it turns out, I, I believe, I mean, this sounds awful, but um, for people like me who enjoy building software, this is literally the best life imaginable. And so I've worked in big companies. I work for investment banks where you get lots of money and it's quite interesting. You work with lots of very smart people and I've worked in startups and a whole load of places. And for me, each of those places are being characterized by waste because you know they're big organizations i'm looking at people part of a <laughs> part of a big organization and frustration at, at at the just the inefficiency of getting you know it's like um it's like some sort of brownie in motion of people with a very slight bias in the direction that you want them to go and it's you know it's very hard so uh and i found that for me the you know being part of a big organization means that you're paid to care about what they care about. And I managed to do that, um, but it's really tough. And, and in the end, um, for me, my type of person, you, it, it ends up being impossible because it's, it's, it, that, that is a big compromise. Whereas um, my life here, I um, get to work on the same thing for 15 years, which is just an incredible opportunity for any of us in any part of life to be able to, to think about something for seven years and then do it you know which in a sense any of us who live more than seven years might do that but to do it to the same artifact is a really great privilege and it means that i'm living with my past self in a way that that uh, it turns out is really interesting and and it has has changed the way that i work working within a community i believe that i've been privileged to see how all of humanity will work in the future that this loosely coupled way of working just feels right. You know, at its best, I work with essentially uh, everybody looking over my shoulder. And so I feel that where sometimes I'll make a mistake and somebody will do a follow up commit or issue saying, oh, did you mean underline, you know, whatever it was. Um, uh, and I get the experience that, I mean, as, as humans, I think, so TiddlyWiki shares my view of what I think the inside of my head looks like. And so through it, I meet people who then talk to me in terms that I can immediately understand about their stuff as well. So it's it, the thing it's really done is it's start, kind of, I don't know, give me a new um, way, a completely new way to interact with other people, you know, um, both in terms of what I learn about them using TiddlyWiki and in terms of how we organize open source work. You know, I work with people who um, uh, can't speak, you know, who, who are not English speakers. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a couple of long-term developers I've worked with in nine years, never spoken to, have no idea about anything about them, but we're, you know, in step. And that feeling of, you know, knowing knowing what's in other people's minds, you know, being in tune with each other, that, that, that's that sort of sense of belonging that we seem to really need. And to say, a, soft, a, a software community like open source builds that, I'm sorry, like TiddlyWiki, um, which is, you know, it's a community of interest around a thing that we're all interested in. But that, that thing is, to your second point, um, Doug, that thing is a reflection of us. I um, mean, you know, I've always felt that you learn more about people standing side by side, focusing on the same thing together than you do by, you know, facing each other and screaming. Um, but if the thing that you're facing together reflects you back in this way, um, and, uh, you know, and Tiddlywiki aspires not just to um, have something to say about the way our minds work individually, but also about the way that, you know, we work together in groups. So long rambling answer, but thank you, Doug. But the perfectly long, unique tiddly story. I suspect they were the first tiddly story story. So um, we'll, we'll close out that segment. And we've gone to black in our imaginations.
and now we'll open a new segment. Um, and it says my internet connection is unstable. That's the gates. Um, Jeremy, I was wondering if we might move you to demo mode. Mm -hmm. Say that again. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Let me um, adjust oh, my no. screen size and some things like that. Ooh, I'm still here. Yeah, and share your screen. And, and although we had talked before about demo. I hope it's Steve that's frozen and not me. I, I believe it is Steve. And if we want to wait for Steve, um, I could fill it because I do have one more question that I'd love to, to know about, but it doesn't have to be at this point. Let's see that and let Steve get his 3G sorted out. <laughs> Which is, you know, as, as I think from TiddlyWiki Classic to what TiddlyWiki is today, it, you know, it's a world of difference. Um, do you envision another jump like that? Or, you know, are you really where you want to be and we're going to grow on the current platform? There would be... So the, the in TiddlyWiki 5 started with a much more ambitious architecture, but still with lots of mistakes and things that I hadn't thought through. And it's only really now that I think that I fully understand, well, fully, <laughs> <I've come up. laughs> um, a hostage to fortune that. But, um, but now I feel I sufficiently understand the whole problem. You know, a lot of tiddly, the software, you make it up as you go along. Yeah? Um, and so that does, in a sense, mean that I have a pent up desire to clean things up. Um, but the thing that's going to end up pushing that is actually the platform um, that as browsers continue to evolve, um, uh, TiddlyWiki gets to the point where there's now, there is already some tension between um, features in the browser that TiddlyWiki doesn't use in the interests of universality and generality. But as the web platform gets better, um, that will change. But the good thing is, I don't. I, nothing's as sort of fundamentally broken about TW5 as TiddlyWiki Classic. So um, I anticipate any future um, uh, TiddlyWiki thing um, would be backwards compatible to a much greater extent than TiddlyWiki Classic. So, I mean, that, that, there still might be things uh, in some future non 100% backwards compatible version. There may be some things that need to be tweaked, um, but it would likely be more like deprecating some features um, in favor of new improved features. Um, but uh, no, my own investment in TiddlyWiki alone means that, uh, uh, that, you know, that backwards compatibility burden is for life because the second, um, I mean, oh, sorry, I should explain that TiddlyWiki takes a very, very aggressive, TiddlyWiki 5 takes a very aggressive attitude to backwards compatibility. And uh, we, lots of new developers stumble um, because they're confused why they can't co uh, correct um, or fix some really obvious things. Um, and in many cases, that's because we just can't do that without compromising backwards compatibility. So a thing, a thing I didn't realize I cared, I didn't realize I cared about note taking. I mean, I was sort of interested in it, but didn't realize I cared passionately about it. And I didn't realize that I really, really care about data ownership. But it turns out it is really important to me that my notes aren't held hostage by a commercial organization. It's just sort of, um, and it's not just a practical thing. It sort of feels like, I wouldn't write my notes in a Coca-Cola notebook that Coca-Cola owned um, and that I only had rental access to. So it, uh, and, and, and I think it's a generational thing that I tend to see online venture capital backed services, uh, sort, of, um, sort of like that. So as this turned out, I've ended up being a staunch defender of you know, digital user rights, which is you know, the right to do meaningful computation on an offline computer that, it, that other people are not party to. Um, the right to modify the software that you use so that it uh, fits your needs. Um, uh, and perhaps some privileges too, the privilege to be confident that your data will uh, be accessible and durable forever. Sorry, Steve, you've, ch you've switched location to better Wi-Fi. Yes, next week. Next week, I will 
actually connect to a real network. I, I went down to the studio and it's bad. Anyway, they've got a nice mic, but next week I'll do it in advance. So, um, but that sounded like a great conversation that, and I, uh, uh, about um, how it is that TiddlyWiki ends up being sort of a serverless. You know, yeah, and the, I, I guess the, it's these. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, Doug originally asked about uh, you know changes to to Lewicki in the future backwards uh, would there be another transition like to Lewicki classics to Lewicki five, um, which I say then leads me on to these things sort of philosophies that I didn't have when I started this, but which interacting with the users has um, yeah. taught me to regard as important. Um, and, and so Peter. Don't look at TiddlyWiki Classic. Stick with TiddlyWiki 5. You'll, you'll be happy. <laughs> you'll probably get confused by following some Google links that end up referring to TiddlyWiki Classic and not to. I was wondering if we could sort of move a bit into demo mode. And uh, mm. Jeremy, if you could take the screen. Yeah. And you talked yes. about showing us um, how the excise feature works, because to me, that's a really important thing. But I was wondering if first you might just give us a quick peek of the federation website because I think that thing is absolutely beautiful, and I just want to make sure that all the folks, especially those in um, in Doug's class and Magenta's class, see that oh, this is way cool. And um, and I know that only takes a few seconds to show. And um, it and does, it does, it does. Well, um, uh, let me see. Yeah, do you have this. do you have this? Oh, there you go. You've got it. Beautiful. So um, uh, Steve asked me to show you uh, the Federational website, and um, that's my company that I use for uh, uh, um, for contracting for the work that I do around to do wiki. And I quite often have shown people this website whilst uh, on Zoom. And one of the things that is hilarious is that their faces turn yellow because uh, Federational.com is the yellowest website in the universe. And in fact, uh, it uses something called the P9 um, color, uh, um, color space to get a brighter yellow than you can get with a normal RGB image. So if you have an iPhone or an iPad or another wide color device, it's this super intense yellow, which for some reason, even companies that have yellow in their logo don't use this kind of secret, super intense yellow. Anyway, this is actually a, um, uh, what we call a static website, which is to say uh, it's a single HTML file with not much in it. It's got 700 lines, uh, most of which is a blob of JavaScript. So this is, this is not Tiddly Wiki, it's just a normal website. Um, it's not Tiddly Wiki. Uh, no, it's made from Tiddly Wiki. Oh, I was going to say. Uh, there's, 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 there's a subtlety in my words there. But okay. uh, uh, it. Um, uh, it does have some interactivity. If I uh, click on one of these thumbnails, uh, then it scrolls down to that position. And if I click on the arrow, uh, then it'll scroll back up. So it was me exploring a very tiddly wiki-esque idea using, uh, this is a technique called scroll jacking, where you use the scroll position to drive an animation. And you can tell what I was trying to do. I wanted this idea that when you come to the website, you see, a thumbnail view of everything and then as you interact with the website you know the thumbnails unfold so that you can uh so that you can read the content um and uh that is made from oh can't type my own urls uh that is made from an instance of um Zemamax, which is an online multi-user version of TiddlyWiki that I use for my um, client work. Uh, so here is the same content, um, but in a conventional TiddlyWiki form. So you, know, you can um, search and so on in the usual way. Uh, and then if I make any changes to Tiddlers, uh, to those Tiddlers, then they automatically get republished to here. So it's a, it's a technique that um, turned out to be important because when uh, lots of people, I think I touched on this, but lots of people in the normal web development community find aspects of TiddlyWiki quite sort of troubling because it is so unorthodox. And one of the aspects that concerns people 
um, is that it's a big ball of JavaScript. So if I turn off JavaScript, uh, which I can do, uh, sorry, behind the scenes here, uh, somehow. Uh, if you turn off JavaScript, uh, the, oh, how do you turn off JavaScript? I can't remember how you turn off JavaScript. Oh, here. This is it. Uh, disable JavaScript. Okay, so disable JavaScript and refresh this page and it doesn't do anything useful. So that uh, lots of us in web development love to snigger at websites that get that wrong and require JavaScript inappropriately. But of course, TiddlyWiki has to require JavaScript, that's its thing. Um, but this ability to generate what, let's say, what we call static websites uh, turns out to be um, uh, was an important part of, I think, TiddlyWiki becoming acceptable to that community, to the people that, um, that want their websites to be uh, nice skinny things without too much JavaScript. Oh, and I should have shown you, obviously, that although this has JavaScript, uh, if I disable the JavaScript, uh, you, um, it still works. Um, so it's very, it's very different type of JavaScript than, than for uh, TiddlyWiki itself. Um, but this is the kind of thing I suppose that shows how TiddlyWiki, although most of us think of it and, and uh, undoubtedly most of the attention is around individuals using the single file edition for personal use, um, that over the years it has grown into a um, into a powerful enough system to uh, do all kinds of crazy stuff. I like to tell people about uh, one of my clients is a law firm um, that <clears throat> has a uh, what well, had a word document that was just hitting 32 megabytes, which is the limit on a word document, 114,000 pages. And they started a project to um, migrate it to TiddlyWiki, which I was extremely doubtful about. It seemed to me that TiddlyWiki would be the last tool <laughs> that you would choose. Uh, but that was, this was like three years ago or something. Um, uh, but their problems were really intense. Just opening the Word document took 10 minutes over the network. Typing a character and waiting for everything to change took like uh, 10 seconds in some cases. Uh, so um, we uh, we turned it into a TiddlyWiki, which turned out to be a hundred megabyte TiddlyWiki with sixty six thousand tiddlers, um, and and it just works uh, with. Uh, and if you search for a string across these sixty six thousand tiddlers, you get reasonable performance, like search results back in a second or so. Um, which is one of the things that's been immensely beneficial to TiddlyWiki that we benefited from. Uh, the advances of browser technology that uh, have just, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's literally no class of software that receives as much, has received as much sustained investment as browsers. And now, uh, you know, so I'm sure you know, um, browsers uh, in terms of performance um, outstrip many of the, well, Java would be the notable um, uh, sort of earlier contender. I'm just getting myself ready for that. You're getting a text. We need a text to excise, right? Yeah, I use, exactly. I use um, my favorite for this stuff is I use Dr. Seuss, Green Eggs and Ham. I think Dr. Seuss has been canceled, hasn't he? Look. I, got, I lose track. <laughs> yes, he's lost. Yes, but um, the Green Eggs and Ham to me because uh, it's only 50 words and, and um, one of the exercises in a former class was to have students Turn that into a wiki where they basically made each word a tag so you'd have 50 tags and, and all sorts of things okay so we're on this gutenberg text great okay so this is um uh steve asked me to show the excise tool in to wiki which is a very interesting choice that um there are some uh if i show you the tiddly wiki text editing interface. It's got a toolbar, kind of a familiar toolbar, similar to other tools that you might have seen, bold and italic and so on. So there's a number of features there that, that, that kind of meet users' expectations for an editor. And so let me use some of those features just to uh, demonstrate the point. Uh, hello, Steve uh, and Doug. Uh, and so, uh, Steve 
can be bold and that can be italic uh, and pizza can be underlined and magenta or may you be squared um, I hope that's okay uh, uh, so that that's the kind of and that, so in order to understand that one needs to understand why it might be important to have this strange formatting and of course the answer is really simple is that if I copy and paste that um, the formatting will be intact you know I can put that somewhere completely different and the formatting will still be there whereas with usual rich text where the formatting is this sort of ephemeral volatile layer on top of the text that you never quite know when the formatting is going to go away you don't get that um, uh, that uh, concreteness but uh, uh, and some of these other functions if I just show you one two three uh, similarly uh, have direct analogs in Microsoft Word this one um, uh, makes a list a bullet list um, and so th these these functions uh, they act partly as a reminder of what the syntax is because um, uh, under uh, any way of looking at it, um, it it really takes more time to find the button and click on it than it does to type the uh, to type the signs at the beginning of each line. Nonetheless, it works really well. So then, uh, one of the things that we started to gradually do was explore tools that were more specific to hypertext. So these are tools that. Um, uh, we might in the future we might be able to look back on and say that they are as primary to the experience of writing hypertextually as copy and paste but we don't know what those tools are yet but this therefore a very interesting area so some of it there's some a very simple example is we've got this thing the stamp tool where i just get a list of things and if i click on it i um i get an associated um chunk of text and I can make my own ones of those. Uh, so uh, I'll call this one Jeremy's Snippet. Uh, and we'll appear in the menu as Jeremy's Snippet. And for the text of the snippet, I will take the first few paragraphs of Alice in Wonderland. OK, so now what I've done there is I can close that to so I've created uh, a, a stamp, we call it, with the text of uh, Alice in Wonderland. So if I select that on any tiddler, it gets automatically inserted. Uh, okay. And the reason Thank me for learning something new today. Thank you. I've never <laughs> used that. Uh, the, um, uh, the purpose of, um, of using this bit of text was to, um, to illustrate uh, uh, a kind of a, a challenge we face that so tiddlywiki has established some really basic tentative principles for writing hypertextually and that is that um, you cut the information you want to write about up into the smallest possible semantic units um, and that you carefully name those semantic units and then you weave them together through links and and other structures and that project for a second those semantic units, they're called tiddlers. Uh, exactly, yes. We call them tiddlers. Other, other people might call them blocks or something like that. And of course, uh, this uh, that isn't how books or texts are published. We're used to consuming texts as linear sequences. Um, but, um, uh, but of course, the construction of a linear sequence is, is of course, always going to be um, the assemblage of lots of little fragments. But so the thing we started thinking about was uh, what are the tools that you'd need to take an existing chunk of text like this and uh, to hypertextualize it. And uh, we came up with this idea of excising. So let's see if we can identify a chunk, uh, uh, a chunk of the book that might be worth taking out. Yeah, maybe it's a terrible piece. Maybe it's, I think actually in terms of its meaning, this may not have been the best example to choose. Um, but, uh, but let's just imagine 
but we wanted to break this into tiddlers in the most obvious simple way which would be um, to cut it up into six separate tiddlers um, so that we've got a paragraph in each tiddler and so one way to do that would be to copy and paste the text individually into a new tiddler but we can also use the excise tool to do it directly so what the excise tool does is it takes that selection um, and puts it in a new tiddler so we'll call that tiddler alice one and then uh, it'll uh, replace um, the text that we uh, had selected with a transclusion of that tiddler. So now the text on the right looks exactly the same because we've got a transclusion of Alice 1. And if I open the sidebar so that we can explore our list of all tiddlers, you can see there's now a tiddler called Alice 1 with that first paragraph of text in. So I'll do it again for the next paragraph. Uh, just a little, just a little sideline there. Jeremy, tick the box to tag with the name of the tiddler, and notice it got tagged new tiddler because that is the name of the tiddler he's working in. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, so here's Alice two going in, and again, it's this paragraph here we're watching that um, <laughs> remains unchanged, uh, even though it's been converted into a transclusion. Uh, so that. That um, a, a sort of um, uh, a, another example, I suppose the, the general case is when you've got a tiddler that's too big and you want to chop it up into smaller chunks, you can use the excise tool. And a bit like copy and paste, the, it's a primitive that does, well, actually two things, because it creates the new tiddler and it, adds, and it replaces the selection. But it does those two things consistently. It never does anything else other than those two things. And the hope is that that's therefore the kind of primitive that once it's lodged in a user's mind, they can apply the primitive to solve a whole bunch of different problems in the same way that we would use uh, copy and paste to solve very different looking problems. But uh, you know, the uh, copy and paste is the hammer that everybody has in text editors. And the other feature I think that's that you've, you've got the paragraph highlighted, you excise this and replace it with a link instead of a transclusion. It illustrates sort of two of the core features of, of hypertext. Um, transclude, oh, you forgot to give it a title, but it. Oh, it did, yeah. But it became new. New, new exception. New and excision. And if I click on that, it'll jump. To that. That. Yeah. Um, and so now it's a link to new excision instead of a transclusion. And so. Peter, I can see the the a little questioning, but what what you're seeing is links and transclusions kind of being built, and that's two fifths of the way towards hypertext. The only thing you have left is templates, lists, and tags. I think that's the list that, list that never ends, though, isn't it? That we always think of new entries on that list. <laughs> Mike and I are, 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 are intellectually having a debate about whether there should be six things or five things, about whether listing is sufficient or if they have to be separated into filtering and sorting, as he's doing in his class. Okay. Well, so, so, Jeremy, though, that this is an amazing concept because it also really feeds into the, the whole notion of just introducing hypertext. Um, you know, as, as we think of people transitioning from the Word documents and from the various data sources, um, you know, I, I can think of actually as we build academic materials, this, this feature is huge. You know, in an old course structure, you have a Word document that's a syllabus. And to be able to start and then use this tool to create it as an interactive syllabus um, is, is tremendous. And you know you can think about this, and as we talk about the academic materials, this is exactly how the the course structure for the summer course is set up. Is we have our assignments, and you know they have a due date, and that's its own tiddler because that's an important chunk. And then we're able to transclude the the due date into multiple tiddlers so that we can put a calendar together. Um, you know we've discovered something. We've we've discovered a, a paradigm that is slightly different than um, <laughs> you know it's the best one can hope for. Um, uh, uh, than, than what's gone before. And it's this, uh, and it stems from the way that TiddlyWiki's wiki text is so rich um, that uh, we use it to build the entire user interface. 
that one interacts with. And that, that uh, it makes TiddlyWiki part of a, a long and, in my opinion, glorious tradition of software tools with the property that they're written in themselves. Small talk is the classic one. So when you sit down in front of a small talk computer, everything that you interact with is small talk. And therefore, once you've learned small talk, you can change any aspect of the system. And these systems, so there's been many over the years, they all tend to uh, emphasize this idea that everybody's needs are different, slightly different. We can invent tools, you know, generic universal tools, but those tools need to be customized for the particular use case. And the, the benefits of doing so are really profound in terms of our efficiency, but uh, you know, in terms of the tools working at all. Um, so yes, um, sorry. Yeah, it, 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 that, that notion of primitives and of wiki text or. or oh, yes, yes. That's, uh, it's something that's been really exciting recently that we've, uh, some of the work I've been doing with um, some, uh, with, with SAC in the community has been on extending uh, what we call action widgets, which are a fairly arcane bit of TiddlyWiki that uh, most users uh, wouldn't, wouldn't well they might they might copy and paste some code including them but they're not uh, they're not central to most people's experience of using tiddlywiki but they're, they're the way that we express imperative actions so you know things that need to happen one after the other um so uh, that because, be, are those the commands that are action new tiddler action new field action do this yes exactly those those kinds of things um, whereas most of TiddlyWiki is what we'd call declarative. So that's to say that this entire user interface that you see here is a product of rendering a transformation of the content of those tiddlers into a visual representation. And that visual representation automatically updates whenever the underlying tiddler changes. Um, and uh, that, uh, that, that's a a consistent, coherent way of doing user interfaces that isn't unique to TiddlyWiki, you know, React and uh, Vue.js, those kinds of tools work in exactly that way too. But they, for their, for their imperative bits, for the, for the times when you want to say, do this, then do that, um, they, do, they use JavaScript. Whereas part of what TiddlyWiki wants to do is to make the kinds of things that JavaScript developers can do be accessible to a much broader set of people. And so therefore JavaScript is, <laughs> is not the answer. But what we found recently is that as we've gradually extended um, uh, these, uh, well, primitives in two areas, action widgets and something called filters, which is like a query language within TiddlyWiki. And both these areas have really grown in the last couple of years that now, it really feels like TiddlyWiki is a full strength programming environment. I, if I could uh, show you one more thing, if I may. A bit. So, so, yeah, while you're pulling that up, I think that's a distinction I hadn't quite realized in my own work. Um, using the action widgets are basically like writing small pieces of code that are sequential sets of actions and using the declarative statements are just changing the whole thing. So as I've learned, it took me a while to get it, but pretty much every keystroke in TiddlyWiki causes a refresh at a certain level. And That's you, right. never know, you never know what the keystroke is going to be, if it's a touch on a button or if you're typing or something, but it, it and because it's a twine, if I get the right word right, um, it just, refreshes itself and there's no call back to the server so that's why it has this yeah in speedy feel but obviously but I I do, um, the underlying work but i can do it that's that's i've never opened i've never written a javascript piece of code but i sense now that i have used it uh yeah uh you won't uh, uh, i mean the, it, yes uh probably um this is a diagram i like to confuse people with um that um Again, lots of people hate it because it's handwritten, but it's handwritten to express uncertainty and you know to 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 be purposefully telling you this isn't reality. This is a sketch of it, you know, but that's that's what you want to try and understand things. And the hundred mile away view is that it's a pipeline that runs from left to right, 
And what that pipeline does is converts wiki text. So the, the, the um, uh, normal narrative text with added gobbledygook um, gets converted uh, in the end to HTML, which is you know, the lingua franca of, bra of browsers. How that happens is immensely important to Tiddlywiki because these, these steps of the process um, are where all of Tiddlywiki's engineering is. And so um, what Tiddlywiki does is having established this pipeline as the way that rendering happens, it's then reused for everything else. So when we save changes, we regenerate the HTML file using this pipeline. Um, when we, a, a um, uh, crazy thing, when you're running TiddlyWiki with a server, so that's where you, you're using it in a browser, but it's connected to a Node.js server. There's actually two instances of TiddlyWiki working. There's one in your browser that you interact with, you modify a bunch of tiddlers, um, and then those changes trickle over to the server in the background. And then from the, uh, to this other instance of TiddlyWiki, and from there, they trickle off to the file system. So that's a crazy architecture, you know, nothing else. Uh, there's lots of software that's isomorphic, which is to say it can run under Node.js or it can run in a browser. But the fundamental architecture of the thing being that, you know, TiddlyWiki is a distributed system in client server mode. It is literally, two instances of the same software running and exchanging data. Very different than the normal um, uh, client server model as we, as we used to call it. Um, and so I, I, I was just gonna show you, <laughs> I, I don't know if this is a good segue or not, but this is something uh, I, I worked on recently that um, shows, I think, how TiddlyWiki now um, is a really easy web development platform. So this is a, it's a complicated questionnaire with, with complicated rules. You answer, it's in, it's, it's in actually it's a sad area. It's, it's for um, the Anna Freud Center that does training for adolescents and young people uh, in, in troubled situations here. Um, so you, you whiz through and answer questions about the severity of the young person's situation. And then uh, you can tick some of the problems as being key problems. It doesn't let you move on unless I click on one. And so you can see here things like each time I click on a key problem, that number goes up and down. Um, and here I've got a kind of overview of all of the questions, um, which also shows me uh, indications of which were the ones that I marked as, as key problems. Uh, and then I'll cheat and answer all the questions in advance. Then there's a, a, a fairly rich presentation of the results. So the purpose of it is to, in a systematic way, figure out what are the best interventions that might help a specific young person. And the challenge that they face is that what a social worker does in the field apparently will be what they enjoyed doing last time, you know, unless they're guided. And so this is an attempt to try and make the treatment of these young people be systematic. Got some interesting features. So now I can I can download a CSV file of the results, which in my case will open not in Excel in a thing called Numbers. I can also download a Word document of the results that um, uh, if I open in Word, uh, you can see. There we go uh, with the dates and so on. So. That's phenomenal, Jeremy. That's just amazing that we've moved in this direction. I gotta, you know, because from back in the TiddlyWiki Classic days when we started, when you started, not we, when you started, there was this idea that we could do that, but you had to do a lot more yourself. You had to build a lot of that work. And now I think what we're yeah. seeing is, is more and more developers sharing these things. And one of the things that is a little, not frustrating, but, you know, Happy, really frustrating. It's hard to keep track of all the people who have links of things that are being done in TiddlyWiki. So I think we've hit this sort of critical mass, which is fun. I, I saw, I just saw TiddlyWiki links the other day, and I added it. Um, and there's just a lot, which is great. Um, so let's wrap. Um, we've my goal here with Design Right, with, with the Tiddly Cast and Design Right Studio, is to have these kinds of conversations, have people watch them and, and get enthusiastic. And then in Design Right Studio, um, 
Anyone who wants to join is free. It's an open class, um, and which means that we'll be responsive as best we can. Um, Peter's a, a, a student in the, in the credit bearing class. So he, he's, uh, Jeremy teases me that, that one of the things he likes about my class is we force people to use Tiddly Week. And that's the only way that they really do it. Um, because it's tough, they get over that first hurdle, but you'll get there, I hope. Um, and so we'll, we'll just have these conversations. Jeremy, thanks so much for taking this time with us. And it's, um, it's great. I love your story. I love, and obviously, um, you know, I went to Oxford, I got to say, I went to the Tiddly Weeky Hangout in, in 18, I think, 2018. And I, I hope you have one again, I'll come. Um, uh, yeah, no, as soon as, uh, as, soon as uh, yeah. things allow. Mm -hmm. And one of my life's goals is we're going to get Jeremy to Utica, and he's going to—he's—he's—we're he's, he's, going to have a Tilly Wiki hangout in, in Utica or New York State. So exactly, we'll get there. Exactly, Thank you all. Well, I look forward to it. Thank you very much, all of you. Much appreciated, and uh, I'll—I'll uh, uh, I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining, Peter, Doug. Thanks. Thank Hope you so work. much, Jeremy. Great pleasure, Doug. Nice to see you. Nice Thanks. to see you, Magenta. Cheers, see Peter. You as well. I know. We'll see you Bye. So yep. We'll stop recording there after we all say goodbye and because you're doing post-production.